Okay, greetings, um, brethren, those who are in house and those who are online. I just want to greet you in the name of Jesus. It is good to be back. You know, many thanks to our Pastor Wallace who filled in for me in my absence. Uh, and I'm sure that you all were blessed by that whatever he had studied, that it would have blessed your heart. Yes, it was good. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. All right, well, I want to begin with my customary recap. And, and this is one time that I am certain that it, it is going to be necessary because we have not been um, here at study like this for maybe about four to five weeks, right, my wallet, something like that? Yeah, about five weeks. So the recap is going to be necessary, all right, just to refresh your mind. All right, we're not going way back, we're just going to where we are now. Remember, we were studying E positive, right? E positive. We're looking at the, the Christian alphabet of qualities, positive and negative ones, and we left off at E positive. Do you remember what E positive is for? Energy. Energy. Okay, E positive is energy. Wonderful. Do um, you remember the definition of energy? If you don't remember, but let, let's look at it. All right, let's look back at it. All right, the definition of energy: the strength and vitality required for sustained physical or mental activity. And remember, I did drop in a spiritual activity also. <coughs> okay. Now, for the purpose of this study, how many kinds of energy are we going to be looking at? How many types of energy are we going to For the purpose of this study, two, and they are physical and spiritual. Okay, two kinds of energy, and um, we, we will be looking at, and we have started looking at physical energy, and we will shortly, uh, in a short while, be looking at spiritual energy. Okay. The last, the last passage of scripture that we looked at, uh, when before I left, would be the Isaiah 41. And I maybe just want to look back at it. Isaiah 40, 28 through 31. Okay, let's move on. Hmm. This is the last scripture that we looked at. It says, Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who hope in the Lord or wait on the Lord as your by my say, will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. That was a promise, right? And it still is a promise to those who hope in the Lord. This is what the Lord will do for us. He will renew our strength. And it's talking about physical strength here because it's talking about running and not getting weary, walking and not fainting. It's talking about a physical aspect. There's a spiritual aspect also, but it's talking about power. Because it says even the young men, young men, yeah, they will grow faint and grow tired and get weary physically. Right? But, but if you hope in the Lord, if you wait on the Lord, and we spoke about waiting on the Lord, it's like wrapping up yourself in the Lord. Um, the Lord being the, the, the huge chain yeah, that holds the cruise ships, whatever, um, to the dock, and you being a, you being a thread in terms of strength. And so when the um, thread wraps itself into that huge chain, you have to break the chain before you can break it. Right? That's, that's the picture that we get. 
And we talk about waiting on the Lord and renewing our strength, getting new strength from God. All right, that was the last um, passage that we did. So we're going to move on a little bit more from here. But before we move on, just join me in a word of prayer. Father God, thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, Lord God, for the meat that is found in your word, the substance, Lord, that we must live on, we must live by. Father God, I pray in the name of Jesus that, Lord, you will bless your word now in the hearts of your people. Use me, Holy Spirit, in a remarkable way, in Jesus' name. Amen. No, no. Those who display a, a lack of physical energy, otherwise called laziness, <laughs> right? Um, slothfulness, the Bible calls it sluggardliness. All right. Those who display that lack of physical energy. Especially towards the work of the Lord. And, and you know, they don't have any conditions. It's not like they are infirm, they are sick, you know, or they are old, or nothing at all. Young and vibrant, and vibrant everywhere else. But when it comes to the Lord and the Lord's work, they behave like sluggards, like slots. Have you ever seen a slot move on, on, on Discovery on one of those channels? I see the slot. Very slow moving creature, right? It, it moves as if it doesn't want to move, right? It, 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 it climbs trees, it goes up and it lives up in the trees. Yes, but, but it's a, a foreign creature and it just barely moving, barely moving. Yeah. Slow. And the other one is slogan. You know that one. You know slugs, right? You know, you, you know slugs. The garden slugs. And you watch them move now? Just look at them move. Why do you think you can run them down with salt and salt? Because <laughs> they can't move fast. They're just they're barely going. Right? And that, those are the two words. The two animals that are associated with these words. Slothful and sluggardly. All right. So, so those who display that that lack of physical energy, that laziness and slothfulness, etc., they are spoken of in scriptures, and the scriptures frown upon their behavior, upon that kind of attitude. It's, it, it's not a good look from the scriptures when you look into it and hear about those who are lazy and sluggardly and stuff like that. All right. Let's look at a couple of those um, passages of scripture. For today. We're just going to be focusing on some of those scriptures. Okay? There is one found in Proverbs 21, 25 to 26. It says, The slogan's craving will be the death of him because his hands refuse to work. All day long he craves for more, but the righteous gives without sparing. It's almost like he's telling us that the slogan is companion to the greedy, <laughs> right? And if you ever notice it, some of the laziest people are some of the greediest people. Eh? They just want, 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 and you wonder what they're eating for. Because they're not expending any energy at all, but they will want. So for argument's sake, if you have a work day, <laughs> right? And I'm not telling you this not to go and look out for people. But if you have a work day at church, right? So the people who work the least will want the most food in them. And then there are some people like me, you know, who come late, who will want to eat. Because <laughs> that's that day. <laughs> yeah, they will tell you they have a baptist. Oh, no, we can't. No, we can't. This morning we wake up. And, but when it comes to the eating part, then we eat more. See? So the slogan is almost companion to the, to the greedy, and yet the slogan refuses to expend energy. It says he refuses to work. 
So his craving is going to be in the death of him because he always wants more. He wants more, but he doesn't want to work. How often do you think people are going to feed people who are healthy and strong and have this craving and yet are lazy? But it says the righteous gives without sparing. And I want to think that it's not just giving off kind and cash and those things. It's also giving off time, giving off energy. The righteous gives that without sparing because they know that they are working in the kingdom of God. They are working for God. Alright? So, so the righteous is a giver and, and, and gives, keeps giving, keeps giving. Right? Look at Hebrews 6. Let's look at that one. 10 to 12. It says, God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. We want each of you to show the same diligence to the very end in order to make your home sure. We do not want you to become lazy, but to imitate those who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. Wow. There are some, some gems from that passage of scripture. It says God is a just God. He's not unjust. He's fair. He's a fair God. Okay? He pays fair wages. Okay, for work done. He will not forget your work. And so we can trust God that when we work for him, that God will pay fair wages. Because he's a just God. Is it, isn't it 1 Corinthians 15, 15 that tells us that what? What it said? You know what it says? Just half the bat? 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Anybody? Talks about your labor not being in vain in the Lord. Yeah? So what happened? When we labor for the Lord, the Lord is just. He will give us a fair wage. I remember that the Lord doesn't pay in money. Alright? The Lord doesn't give back in money. The Lord gives back in what? In what? Blessings. Blessings. Spiritual blessings for the most part. Because that's what the Lord wants for all of us. He wants to bless us spiritually. Some people have power of the erroneous view that all that God wants to do is to bless his people physically. No. No, no, no. They can be as poor as a church mouse, as they say. And God to them. God wants to bless his people with spiritual blessings more than everything else. He wants your spirit to prosper even more than your wealth or your well-being. Yeah. Because ultimately, everything that you do for your flesh, anything to gratify the flesh, you realize where the flesh is going? Flesh is going in the ground. It's not going anywhere. It's going in the ground and it's going to go back to dust. But the spirit that man has, when the spirit has all of these blessings associated with serving God and working for God, and you have all these blessings, where is your spirit going? To be with God. Yes. Everybody is going there and it's going to stop there. Right? So, so, so don't be, don't ever think that the only blessings that God gives people are physical blessings, monetary blessings. Blessings in kind. No, no, no. Those blessings, anybody can get them. And anybody can give them. And I say that. Let me say it again. Those blessings, anybody can get them. And anybody can give them. 
Satan can't be physical in this What? I just talking to some young people and telling them that, or it was maybe a young person, and telling them that. That Satan is not afraid to give people physical blessings. Is why not why God blessing? Why not curse? Huh? Because you've not seen a lot of these persons. We would have looked at the boy, they have been blessed and they are tormented. You wonder some things that they get in the Most they are cursed. Inevitably, if Satan gives it, it's going to be a curse. It's going to be a curse. That's going to be something that will add value to you. Well, you know what I want? There are times when the enemy can give what would seem to be a curse that God can turn into a blessing. Yeah, because some people who would have, say, been cursed with something that the enemy has given them can turn around and accept the Lord and use that same thing to bless people's lives. You get me? So, so, so they were out there in the world, they made a fortune, by the enemy giving them a hoping to extract back his pound of flesh, which is their soul, right? And then somewhere down the line, those people realize that nobody can give anything in exchange for their soul. It doesn't profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul. And so he comes to the Lord. But he comes to the Lord with all of these physical, quote-unquote, blessings that he got from the enemy that he now turns around and uses it to bless God's people. You, you follow me? So, so sometimes what the enemy wants to be, and, and if you check it out, you know, once you are God's people, anything that the enemy needs for good, God can turn it for evil. God can turn it for good in your life. I remember, I remember there's a passage of scripture that talks about the wealth of the wicked, yes? Being given to the righteous. <laughs> so, so yes. So what we are hearing here are some truths. God is faithful. You are saying something. No. God is faithful. God is a just and fear God. God remembers works of love. He's, and notice this. He remembers the works of love shown to people. And considers those works of love as being shown to him. So it's come up here and you read it. I you read it. He says, he says, um, here, he will not forget your work and the love you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. So God considers what is done for his people to assist them, to help them to work with them, to serve them, as serving Him and showing His love. Right? So God is not going to forget what is being done to, for Him, to Him, by you just serving and working for other people. He remembers, okay? He remembers. So, so what we are being told in this is to be diligent. Be diligent, yes. We are told to be helpful, help others, and we are told to be loving because he says your works of love. So help others out of love. And we are told also to be imitators of good habits. That's why he said, don't, don't become lazy, but imitate those. Who through faith and patience inherit what has been promised. Alright? This is a passage of scripture in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 14. Remember what happened the situation with Thessalonians Christians. If you remember it, the, 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 the background is this. Somewhere down the line. <laughs> They, and I'm just giving you the gist, somewhere down the line, the Christians in Thessalonica believed that the day of the Lord was coming in their lifetime. And the Lord would come back in their life. Now, if you believe that the Lord is coming back in your lifetime, there are some things that you will do. So, all right, let us say we believe the Lord is coming back next month. 
You have some things that you're going to do, right? If you really believe in coming back next month, you have some things that you would do that you would not normally do. True? Is, is, is me one believe that? No. Oh, okay. All right. So, so hold on now. These people believe that the Christ is coming back in their lifetime. So they started to do some weird little things, sell some stuff. They started to top work. But we, but we would have seen that in our life. <laughs> it happened, right? I'm sure it happened in our oh, lifetime I, I, too. Yeah. Right? We had some Thessalonica and Christians who, who, in our lifetime, so, um, who had the same attitude, sell this and stop work and go in a little commune and, and then waiting for the for the Lord to come. So Paul spoke to them. Paul spoke to that attitude that was happening among them. Paul says, and we urge you, brothers, warn those that are idle. Warn them against idleness. Tell them that they must be idle. Stop being idle, okay? Encourage those who are timid or fearful, right? Help the weak and be patient with everyone, right? No, no, there's another uh, passage of scripture in First Thessalonians that is even more graphic as it addresses the situation that was happening there, okay? All right, um, let me start. Let, let's, I, I know we're going to go to it, but let's go to that proverb scripture. All right? One who is slack in his work is brother to one who destroys. And being slack in your work still is not, is not, is not um, necessarily just being a, a bad worker. You know? It is not wanting to work the way you ought to work. It is somebody who has slackened in his work. So, so, so for argument's sake, you might have people, and there are people in church like that too. They, they used to do some things. They used to do some stuff in church, and, and they used pre-COVID. Right? They used to be active and working and everything. And then they slack off. They slack off. So you know what happens? Here is one reason why the scripture could say that the one who does this is brother to the one who destroys. Watch what happened. Let us say I was in church. I was working in a particular area in church. A ministry. Okay? Say I was the head of the benevolence ministry for Alright? And that's what I used to do. I used to plunge myself into that. And I just slack off on that. You realize that some things are going to be destroyed. You realize that I am heading the destruction of some things within that ministry. You don't realize that. I slack off. I used to be vibrant and slack off in benevolence. And I just, I, I, vibrant and, and active in benevolence. And I just begin to slack off. Some things we have been destroyed. What does benevolence do? It looks after the needs of people, right? It looks after the needs of the brethren. It looks after the needs of people who have needs. And if I slack off on it now, what's going to happen? Those needs are not going to be met as they ought to be met. Something is going to be destroyed. So my lackadaisical, lazy attitude will cause things to become defunct, sometimes destroyed, no more. Just because of my lack of days in that. Churches have gone down like that. Yeah. Laziness and just laser fear kind of thing, and nobody no one do nothing again, and, and, and the church go down. 
So when it says that the one who is slack in his work is the brother of the one who destroys, you can understand what I'm trying to say. Because something is destroyed when you are slack. I'm slacking off in your work. Something is going, going to be destroyed. Right? And it's going to be what you used to be work, working in. Something going to be destroyed. Okay. Right? Sometimes people feel as, as if they are over the brink and things. So we, we would have seen that and, and it is so true. But that was a tough one. But some things die. Because you're always having to look for successor. You have to look for yeah, someone. You can't you find a successor. In this same study, you know the address that you find right. a successor. Right. And you're looking for a successor, you can't find any. And the person who is the right person for it, they're just stuck off. So the thing will match up. So if it is the latest group, the latest group will just start to get, you know. Until it is destroyed, until there's no more ladies go. You can't find a, a person to fill the position that this person who was the best person for the job has decided to start to get stuck. So in any ministry, something like that can happen. Right? And not necessarily that they can raise in this case, but so they lose energy as it relates to God's work because their energy is placed somewhere else. So you find that people place a lot of energy into the workplace. A whole heap of energy. Maybe, maybe if, if you were to put energy on a, say, a, 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 a 1 to 100 percent, maybe they give all 75, 80 percent of their energies to the world. Outside there, to secular work. And so when the time comes, and they want to give energy now to, 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 to work within the church, is it get leak? Because you don't have anything to give. You don't have anything more to give and you claim you're tired and you claim you're burned out and, but you never claim that with your job. How many people here say, boy, it's my and job and the burn out that never done? And when they tired, you still push. All when they tired, you push. And what happened? Is the can carrot being dangled in front of you, you know? The carrot, but it's the carrot that is dangling in front of you as you go to work. What were the characters? Your money, your salary. And, uh, and, and for some person, it is a good name. For some people, it's a good reputation or a good name. Yeah. But the real carrot is your salary. That's what is dangled before you. And because God doesn't dangle a carrot like that, that you can see, you will believe that God's work, so we can just take it. Yeah, take it for granted. But God has done the carrots in front of us. He said to us that he will not forget your labor of love. That's a carrot he's putting in front of us. Remember that when you work, right? I will repay you. Because we're not seeing it in cash. We just said, oh. I'm just taking it from right. Mm. We get lax when it comes to the work of the Lord. But any other work, as long as we get in the carrot, we will work for it. We deal with it. We deal with it. And I tell you that's a bad attitude, you know, that we have, you know. Because I tell you this kingdom work. Kingdom work, you know, is the best work that you can do, you know. Because it has the greatest reward. It has the greatest reward. Kingdom work. If you could get five million dollars a month out there working in a secular job, eh, it cannot compare to what you will get within kingdom work. These 
steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Kingdom work. You know, in the Lord who answers Right? So, right, it is not for you and me to stop. But here it is, example. These same people who have stopped up are not doing much for the Lord in the kingdom of God. These same people are in need. That's a prayer for me. You know, I want God to, I got to, I need God to bless you. Healing, whatever. Whatever you really examine it. <laughs> why should why should God? I know he's loving his care, but he said if you are disobedient, he can have a person. So what should you mean? You know, and I don't know if you're reading on that teaching fellow Christians that that listen. If you are disobedient, you are not going to get a person. You know, you see, but part of all this, let's take it even a step further. These same people would pray and ask the church to pray for the job. And they get the job. Before they had the job, they were kingdom workers par excellence. They were just working for the kingdom. And they get the job. And then very soon they start to hear this. I have to work on Sundays, you know. I have to work overtime, you know. When I come from work, I'm tired. I can't come. I work late Saturday, so I can't come work on church on Sunday morning. And you hear all manner of excuses. But these are the same people who ask God for that job. And I sometimes think, I don't know, I may be facetious, I'm flying in God's face. But I sometimes think that is not God give them. I believe that because God, a house that is divided against itself, cannot stand. Why would God be dividing it against himself? Why would God put you in a position where you can't serve him the way that God wants you to serve him? Why would God do that? Something that would be wrong with God. But God would be fighting against himself. But again, uh, sometimes when it tries that person making up, yes. you can speak to them and, and they are, sometimes I find it strange that Sunday work for a Sabbath man and man that is taking me no one straight. Needs a Sabbath man. And the same proposal is made. So alright, they say shift that on Sunday and you say alright, the work. Sometimes I find it strange that I always laugh and smile and say, the question should never be asked if it can be switched to a Sunday. If a Sabbath man will not deal with this Sabbath. So sometimes it's just a choice that we be Good. There are Sabbath people who, who, who if they want to work on a Sabbath, they don't work. They leave the work. And then tell you straight up, say, I am not going to be working on my Sabbath. They tell you that. It's true. And I'm And I'm saying. And I say to myself that um, while well, we as Christians, Sunday Christians, we we be man, we afraid to approach the bars and the bars and we have to go to church, you know. I have to go to church, I have to fellowship. So that's the bottom line. Can I have my Sundays? No, you can't. We're okay with it, can't have my services then. And trust God. Just trust yeah. God. Yeah. Afraid to walk away. Yeah. Because sometimes we believe that there's only one opportunity out there. Right? And we don't know that we have a God who open door yeah. that nobody can shut. And shut doors that nobody can open. Yeah. That's the kind of God we serve. Yeah. I tell you, say, and I tell you, frankly, I believe that I believe that there are some Christians who choose overtime work. They don't have to work overtime, but they choose overtime work and then are tired. Come to Bible study, they can't come Bible study because they have to work overtime on a Wednesday. 
right? You get me? And they choose that. It's not nothing is forced on them. They choose it. And I tell you, you know, it is just a matter of where your priorities lie. What is your commitment? What are you committed to? And what we find out is that a number of us are not committed to the walk of Christ. We're not committed to it. When I remember said that we hear of Jesus, the foxes have all birds have nests, but we don't have no fruit, amen. And then we have more than place for the our head. Yeah? We now try to pan down on the road and walk up and down in a sand And yet we are, as I said, of the wimpy sound. Wimpy when it comes to the Lord's word. I, I don't know, I just I feel I just feel very, very I mean when it when we talk about this, very emotional about this because Christianity is all about sacrifice. I mean, that's what it's about you know. If we are not willing to sacrifice, we are not willing to follow Jesus. Yet. Because that's what he said. If a man wants to be my disciple, he must deny himself. Take up his cross and follow me. Prepare to die to himself. Sacrifice is the key word for Christianity. And if we can't sacrifice, then the one who sacrifices life for us is not looking down on us favor. It's wondering if we really think that we can be his disciples. And we're not sacrificing. We don't sacrifice time. We don't sacrifice energy. We don't sacrifice anything for kingdom's sake. Have a look into ourselves, man. We have to start to realize that look, the kingdom of God is about sacrifice. It's not about us. Yeah? It's not about God. It's about what Christ did for us that we can never repay him. For the sacrifice he made. Why is it that we can't make a simple sacrifice like time for it? When he made a sacrifice of his life for us. Tell him we didn't get some beat this I can tell you that. Because I'm gonna throw myself at the mercy of God because we have some beat to get to say. Yeah? Yeah. That we can't go before God and tell God some foolishness. Because God knows the heart. He knows the heart. Let's, let's, let's look at another, another passage of scripture. I think maybe we'll come up to go. We don't reach the one here. Proverbs 13:4. The slogan craves and gets nothing. <laughs> but the desires of the diligent are fully satisfied. <laughs> Explain that for me. The slogan craves and gets nothing. Explain it from Tell me what that is saying. Because looking at it at face value, you know, you might not get exactly what it's saying, you know, but just look at it deep and think of what is it saying. What is this thing? All right, my person said a slogan's appetite is never failed. But the desires of the diligent are fully satisfied. Um, it's not like the question for me to ask you is this. Who satisfies? So when the word of God says the slogan craves and gets nothing, who is he going to get that nothing from? Because he, he said that the appetite is never satisfied. Who gives him nothing? People? God, tell me, who you think gives him nothing? Because he says he craves and he gets nothing. Who gives him nothing? Huh? Come again, Mr. Bantam. 
It is God who does not give anything to a slogan. Even though he craves for it, he gets nothing from God. And it is the things from God that truly satisfy the things of this earth. Yeah, there's a little word that says, um, mm, all I want is more of you. Mm -hmm. And it says, earthly springs have left me dry. Only you can satisfy. All I want is more of you. All I want is more of you. You know, in that course, you know it? <laughs> Maybe we should be. I know they love it over Antigua, right? I always sing that course of that. Earthly springs have left me dry. So when I drink from the earthly springs, I'm still dry, I'm still thirsty. This is what Jesus said to the woman at the well. You remember what he said to her? He said, you know, you drink this water, but you get thirst again. You know? But if I give you water, I can give you living water, and you know, that means you never have to come here so get the water again. You know, you know how to get the water? Because I can give you the water that satisfies. So when we go, when the slogan craves, because the slogan is a slogan, then he gets nothing from God. But it says, if you are diligent for me, the ones who are diligent, he says, their desires are fully satisfied. Wow, what a promise. But also, we will talk about God. Look at the kind of days of man. He desire a house. He desire to have furniture. He desire all of his good things. Because he sees those who work and work hard having them. And so he desire to have them yet. He can't have them, you know. Because he doesn't really put his foot at the wheel to earn so that he can do his thing and give to others too. What do what, what you think that was said? You know who a lot of satisfies the most? The slogan. Because you see, if a man is hard working and then buy a lot of he knows that he must have him salary to, to go back on. He knows that he has something to fall back on because he's working. The slogan, however, begged Pastor Jackson to hundred dollars to buy food and run up or was here and buy a lot. See so what I'm doing to, to, to the slogan now? The slogan is somebody who is always craving. And let me tell you something, none of them win Japan. All Satan does is set them up. Them come with them hundred dollar and Satan might give them fifteen hundred, three thousand dollars. And I say, yes, yes, yes. And go back again. And if they come to how many hundred dollars they put in and don't get none. The little foolishness that they didn't get the last time, done the long time. But it says if you are diligent. Your desires will be satisfied. And it works not just towards God as a several audience, but also naturally. Naturally, if you are if you are a hard work, the, um, Proverbs, a proverb says that you know it is hard work that you get gain. Yes. By labor, you get gain. That's a natural thing that happens. So if you are diligent, you will be able to meet your needs. Yeah. You'll be able to satisfy your food, your clothes, whatever. Your needs will be met. Also, to search home. Looking at the, the slogan of craves is at the wrong place. Because hence, there is no satisfaction, no way. So even if he gains whatever he gains, there lies no satisfaction. Because there exists no satisfaction. And things for the diligent, where they crave, satisfaction lies there. So it is like you examining, examining yourself and putting a lot of work and 
then you really look at it. It's a whole post inventing. So they do say. Sorry. So ends you then have to reassess and see where your desire should last. I, I, I like that because what happened is that the, 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 the man who is diligent, I'm talking about the man of God now, who is diligent, his desires will be in line with God's will. That's why his desires will be satisfied. He will not want to desire something outside of God's will. So he will, whatever he prays about, and so he will still recognize it is your will, God, and not mine. So how oh, oh, can a man let that not be satisfied? Because if he says, Lord, I need a care for all the good sake. But he says, it's your will, you know, not mine. And he gets a bike. <laughs> right? That's the argument, see? And he gets a bike. He's satisfied, you know? Because what he's going to say is that it was not God's will for me to get a car. So he give me a bike. So I praise the Lord. And even if, if he gets nothing. If he gets nothing, he still will say, it's God's will. Yeah. There must be a reason why God says he's not going to get a car. Maybe God sees me dead in a car accident. And he want me to go and live. So he didn't give me no. So he will never, he, he will learn what is called contentment. And the contented person is always satisfied. Whatever my lot, whatever my lot, though I start me to say it is well with myself. Whatever my lot, it's good. I'm, I'm good. I'm good. And this is the secret of contentment that Paul found. Yeah? Whether, I, whether things going good, I'm all right. If, if things not really go so good, I'm good. If it's famine, I'm all right. If it's peace, I'm nice. He understand me, and he says, whatever situation he has found himself in, he has learned to be contented. And contentment is satisfaction. So the desires of the diligent will always say, I'm satisfied. When we're talking about God's Okay? Moving on. I think this is it, you know. I think this is the one that we'll be talking about. Yes. <laughs> so then Paul get bring up. Right? <laughs> Paul says, we hear, and that is what? Second, let, let's go back to that. See, take second Thessalonians 3 and verse 11. And he says, we hear that some among you are idle. They are not busy. They are busy bodies. Such people we command and urge in the Lord Jesus Christ to settle down and earn the bread they eat. Like what the King James puts it up. You know, King James actually says that, you know, if you're not working enough, you, know, you shouldn't even eat. If you refuse to work, not that you're not working, maybe I should put that down. If you refuse to work, if you're able to work and you refuse to work, you shouldn't eat it. You shouldn't eat. What are you eating for? Huh? What are you eating for? Because I think I said that when we work, we, we sustain ourselves with food. Yeah, we have to metabolize food and everything like that to get back energy to do some more work. But if you're not expending energy, where are you eating from? What do you want to replace and replenish? Yeah? What is what are you losing? You're not losing them. You know, some of are just idle, right? So it says, settle down and earn the bread. Earn it. Right? Don't just be a sponge. Okay? We have, to, we have to recognize that there. There's a time for everything. We have to um, recognize that as children of God, we have to expend energy in the kingdom of God. Right? I'm, I'm talking about worldly energy now because when we expend worldly energy, we expend it for the world. But I'm talking about energy for God. We have to learn that we need to expend energy for Almighty God. Amen? Amen. And the final scripture.
scripture that I want to look at is this. Proverbs um, 6, yeah, that was it, 6 to 11, Proverbs 6, 6 to 11, and it says this. Check out the ants. Slugger. Go to the ant, thou slugger. Consider its ways and be wise. A slugger, somebody who is lazy and slothful, is being told to go and observe ants. Why? Tell us a part of it, but why? There are words on this part. They are always working. They are always doing something. And if they're not working, they are always moving. <laughs> and they might not be lifting up anything, but they are always going somewhere. They are patrolling. They are always going somewhere. And they are wise enough to work hard and store up for the hard times. Right. So we're coming to that. Yes, yes. So it is those people who are inert, those people who are inactive, those people who are lacking in energy in God's church. Maybe we need to take them outside into a hand's nest. Not put them in it, but just put them to observe what is happening in that hand's nest. Oh, I thought that was going in the midst of it. Don't stop moving. <laughs> right, okay. But yeah, because when you consider the way of the ant, if you are a slugger, if you are somebody who is lazy, and you consider the way of the ant, you will learn wisdom. And not just consider its ways, but pattern its ways. And you will be wise. It has no commander. And still have any commander. I want a, a, a high commander. Whatever. Some of the answers might be bigger than some. Right? But let me tell you something. They don't have any commanders, first. They don't have any overseer or ruler. Do you know that so many people in God's church only work under overseers and commanders? And that's sad enough. You only get people to work when you push them, when you are there watching them. And that we do that at kingdom work, and you know, so we carry those things over into actual workplace work. We are people not working unless the supervisor is watching them. It's a free for all. Them doing them nails, them doing all kind of things, them on them phone doing all kind of things. And they are in customer service. You, know. you are there waiting on them, you know. And then go and go take coffee and then do everything else because the supervisor is not there. One, and because the supervisor might be just as wretched as they are. Because I see sometimes supervisors come up to the ranks. Yeah, not true. Yeah. And they were just like that when they were not supervisors. So they can they'll be hypocrites. To, to come to say no, hey, listen. How oh, do you mean to take coffee break now? How do you mean to be doing your nails? I'm a boy just live on the phone. They'd be a hypocrite to do it because that's what they used to do before they became supervisors. But in God's church, the paradigm has to be different. It's a different paradigm. We are working for the Lord. Nobody in the church is working for Ella Walker. When you do church work, is that the other work you're doing it for? So if I said to you, say, okay, we're going to do this, we're going to be in, inside the building, we're going, is that the other work alone we're going to benefit from this? You are a part of the thing too. So why is it that we need overseers? We must be like the ants. We don't need overseers to do kingdom work. We just do kingdom work. Just do it because you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Just do it. Nobody has to be around you, begging you, 
Um, how come, eh? Carl, you know, Timmy, you say, uh, Brother Cliff, eh? How come you just a sit down, sir? Eh? You don't come for work, Bertie? And Cliff lang up in face, get up, and go come for a little break, and uh, for two minutes, and go back and sit down again. And you, it should never be like that in God's world. Better hit surgery. The eyes of the Lord is on everybody, right? And the yes. Lord is over, overseer. And him and the overseer. Yeah. Him is the CEO. <laughs> him watching everybody. Him and everybody on video. Alright? But when we don't have these earthly people over us, cracking a whip, we don't work. It's almost like a slavery mentality. Yeah? Because that's what, this, that's what a slavery was. Yet it says, it has no commander, overseer, or ruler. Yet it stores its provisions in summer. It's always working and gathers its food at harvest. And next week is always by the remember. Sunday, 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 not this week, Sunday. So, Sunday, not next week, brother. <laughs> brother, I think Sunday is the first year to meet us up. Ouch, please. <laughs> but yeah, uh, next week. So, Sunday coming, maybe make it clear, will be harvest. Please remember it, okay? The ants gathers its food at harvest. So you always see running with little something. Some of them are eggs. Yeah? Some of them are eggs you know, running with because you no know, rain will fall. And it's anytime you see ants running with some little white things in their mouth, look for rain. You know that? Is it? Is them eggs them carrying you know, them carrying them eggs to higher ground? Because they don't want the rain to wash out their eggs. So they grab them eggs and everybody running with eggs and running to higher ground. Running for shelter. Rain will fall. Yeah, man. I don't know them little things here. You know, the, the, the animals can teach us a lot about nature. They know when earthquake coming. They know when hurricane coming. They know when rain coming. We just have to know their pattern. So if you see some bird, I would flock a bird and see them fly, 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 fly. Smoke my go up. The more up, the smoke my go up. see them fly like crazy. Smoke the go up. They are more aware of what is happening around them in nature. How long will you lie there, you slogan? So you see, the slogan is always in a lying down position. How long will you lie there, you slogan? When will you get up from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. And poverty will come on you like a bandit and scarcity like an armed man. A bandit don't want you now. <laughs> an armed man, an armed robber don't want you now. Say, I'm coming in now. I'm coming to drink you down now. No, no, no. It just happens. And that's what it says. You will just realize how poor you have become simply because you were a slugger. You are there folding your hands instead of doing something and you will just, in, in a day, you will recognize how much you have lost. How poor you have become. And for us, I want to put it in a spiritual way you now to say that when we refuse kingdom work, poverty will come upon us. And that poverty is a spiritual Poverty. We become spiritually impoverished. You know, more with us. It's almost like the things of God. They don't mean anything to us anymore. Simply because we never plunged ourselves in kingdom work willingly. We are always sluggardly, asleep. Yeah? Always not doing anything. And I want to say it clearly that because next week I'm going to go on to spiritual energy. God never called any of his people to come sit down at church, warm bench, get up and go home. Never called any one of us like that. Never. The people whom he calls, he has a purpose for them. And we need to find purpose in God's church. 
God calls us to work. He says, listen, the, 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 the fields are white unto harvest, but the laborers are few. Pray that the Lord of harvest will send laborers out there. There's a field out there that is ripe for harvest, but there are not many people who want to go. And so when we don't go, when we don't do any kingdom work, we are actually negating that prayer of the Lord of harvest. So, so let us let us be diligent, right? There are some people who can't do much, you know. But whatever you can do, do it with your might. Do it with your might and do it all to the glory of God. God bless you. Amen.